He's going about doing what looks like wasn't the will of God, but at the same time, what he was doing was fulfilling the will of God. Because what he was doing, because see, in, in, in the book of Acts, when they got the Holy Ghost, one of the things the Bible says, you know, you're going to start in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then to the utmost parts of the world. For seven years, they didn't move out of Jerusalem. They needed help. They weren't going nowhere. You had all the apostles and all the prophets and everybody was all situated for about seven years. They never left Jerusalem. But God's word said, you're going to take this to the uttermost parts of the world. Guess what God used to help them? He brought Saul in and Saul caused them to put on a pair of flowers and they was running all over the country. And as they ran, they were telling everybody about Jesus in flight. So, but Saul, who looks like he's really against God, is working for God. There's a lot of enemies that works against you, but they're not really your enemies. They're God's enemies doing his work. Matter of fact, the Bible even says, I think in Isaiah, he said, I'm the one that gives that, that farming, stokes the coals. He gives him his strength. That's why you don't have to worry about the devil every day because it's God is still in control. Just because something comes against you doesn't mean that God's against you. He's probably for you. I know he's for you. And what he uses against you is to move you into his perfect will. And then he turns around. He makes Paul an enemy of the people. Isn't it like God then turns around? Got everybody hating him. And then he turns around and says, I mean, that's, that's a, don't you think it's kind of funny? Because, see, he won't save people to be saved. You said, well, what do you mean by that, Brother Wilson? Well, now, see, then he, he makes this dude show up to those same people he done killed, their family members, turn their homes out, and now they got to love him. What do you think about that, Sister Paul? Wouldn't that be kind of hard? Guy come in, tear your family up, kill your cousins and outlaws, got you running all over the place, you can't even hold a job, and all of a sudden he's going to show up one day preaching you about Jesus. He's going to be telling you how the gospel is the power of God and the salvation that everybody believes. And you sitting there seething on the past because of what they'd done to you a long time ago. And you can't see yourself loving somebody like this. And, and, and here is, is Paul. Now he's really on the bad end of this thing because now he's looking out here saying all this stuff out of none of them. I love them. I got to love them. Because see, if you don't hurt somebody, you got apprehensions too. Because that's none of us that's not without insecurity. And there is that level of us that we really do want to be accepted. And so here's Paul preaching to people that he have destroyed their homes and they supposed to be Christians. Because see, most people think it's Christian because of what church you went to. Or they think it, it was the rituals we go through. Ain't but one real richer that really named you as a Christian. Just one. Just one. Because God used Paul to create, make him an enemy, and then turned around and created Paul to become their brother. Wow. And you had to accept it. I tell you, I, I, you know, one thing I don't do, I don't like to lie to myself. I told you, I had a friend once before. Guy, I want to get all my life, and then I got saved. And I didn't want to get saved. I didn't want to be saved that day when I seen him. 
the last thing I want to be was saved. Do you know how long, how many years I had saved up for him? Hmm. Do, you, do you know how many years I had waited for him and then finally I see him and then God now stepped up and messed up my life like that and saved me? You see, but God loved him too, too. <laughs> God loved him too. I didn't realize that. Because I was always under the impression that if I don't like them, right? No, nah, no, nah, go ahead. Look this way. Because I know, I, I know, I know. I know how we think. Because if we don't like them, guess who else don't like them? God don't like them. We got a whole list of people that God don't like just because we don't like. And the last I read, I didn't find nobody he didn't love. Not one. And I've been very dogmatic in my life, but I, I had to come to terms with stuff. <laughs> Not that I'm promoting anything, no kind of stuff like that, but I'm telling you right now, I cannot deny anybody the love of God. That's why the Bible say, oh, no man, nothing. And every man you meet, every person you meet, you are indebted. Not, not to give them money, not to give them your car, your house. A lot of times it's a lot cheaper to give them money than it is to give them what you really owe them. I would have pay you off to get out of my face. They had to sit around and love you. I got cousins in my family now. When I see them coming, I'd rather just go and give them two dollars. <laughs> so I ain't got to stand around and try to love them. <laughs> because it's cheap. And there's so many people today who are caught up in this thing and not knowing. Every person you deny what you owe to, that's on your own. You, you, don't, you don't have no reason. You're cheating yourself. You're cheating yourself. And it's never based upon whether or not you think they deserve it. Because once again, what made you deserve it? Hmm? Anybody? Think about it. Is, was there anything that made you deserve this? No? Then why, you, why can't they not deserve the same thing? Why can't they get this? That's why the Bible tells you, don't owe no man nothing but to love him. Well, I, I can't love because they, they ain't right. Were you right when you start, when God started loving you? Were you right? Were you? Well, maybe I I know some of y'all was born right. I wasn't. I was born at night too. <laughs> I was born at night, so I know I wasn't right. <laughs> so I know that anything God gave me it wasn't because I deserved it. And there are times where I just keep telling myself that Kelly. You didn't do nothing to deserve this. Some of you need to tell yourself that too. Because you in here about five minutes with the baptism of water still dripping and all of a sudden you thought you really deserved this. And what you deserve is so undeserving for everybody else. Man, I have to learn a lot of things. I believe, I believe I'm learning more now than I've ever learned in my life. Because it's so simple. We've made it so complex. And it's just simple little things that God requires of us. And the things he really requires of us is the thing we don't want to do. But if, it, if you want me to build a tower, you, you want me to build a, a tower, I can do that. But you want me to love him? Don't ask me to do that. I'll build all the bricks. I'll make all the bricks you want to make. 
build it as big as you want to make it. But that's not the will of God. There's a lot of times the things that we call unity is probably not unity. Should be, but it's not. It'd be nice if it was. See, most time we, we, we force us into a false unity. Because we're only as unified as our hearts are. We're not unified in the flesh. We should never try to make unity fleshly. But basically, though, being humans that we are, we, te we tend to lean more toward familiarity. And so we, you know, you live in the church, you know, I've been around about 40 years preaching, and we get up, you know, well, we got to have unity. You know what the Bible in the book of Acts, they's all in one place and one accord in one place and all that. They had unity. And we've been trying to recreate. We even got churches that have upper rooms because they think if you get up high in the rooms, you're going to get more unity. <laughs> you know what really get me? You only read one time when he was up there. And I believe they got unified up there. I really do believe a real unity came in. But unity didn't keep them upstairs. Now they could have stayed in that room and said, Woo, look at here. We got so much unity. Oh, Lord, ain't we? Because God didn't want them to stay up there and, and sing kumbaya, hold hands. We got such a unity here. No. I want you to take what I gave you, take it out there. The Holy Ghost didn't leave them up there. We're still trying to get the Holy Ghost to lead us back to the upper room. Ain't happening. I told you I was in Chicago this time about Pentecost Sunday and upper room experience. I ain't even trying to have an upper room experience no more. Man. The upper room that came down and had a world experience. They had a, a, a people experience. Holy Ghost ain't just for you. The Holy Ghost ain't just to keep you up there in upper room, sealed off from the world. The Bible says this, this thing here is a light on top of a hill that cannot be hid. And so here we are trying to practice unity because that's what they did at the Tower of Babel. They had unity. That's no denying that. And I can say probably since I've been in church, I ain't never seen nobody unified like they were at the Tower of Babel, and that was the Tower of Confusion. But yet, they had such a unity that even God said, I'm going to have to go down here and kind of mess up the way they talk because their unity wasn't bringing people to God. Their unity was bringing people to people. But they weren't bringing them to God. God wasn't in the tower. God wants to be in the people. So a lot of things that we unify around is not bringing people to God. It's just bringing people to us. Then the sad part about them bringing them to us is like the father said about his son, when he had all them demons. And the uh, father wanted to bring them to the disciples. And he finally brought them to the disciples, found out disciples couldn't handle it. Matter of fact, they was probably trying to brush away their mistake or brush away him. The man went to Jesus, said, I brought them to your disciples. They couldn't do anything. That's what I know today. You, you may come to people, but be, when it's all said and done, your job and my job is not to bring them to me or you. They need to come to Jesus. What I can't do, I know he can. And a lot of things, if we understood, what we need to have is not a lot more sense. We just need more Jesus. 
I am, I am really believing that we can give him away if we got him. But I'm going to tell you this is the truth. I'm glad he gave me a few of them little Benjamin Franklins or something in my pocket. So when I ain't, <laughs> when I don't want to give them Jesus, I just give them 50 cents. You know, because you tell people God can help you. Have you ever tried to tell people that? You want to see them get mad? Let them come to you for help. And say, come on, let's pray about it. Praying? <laughs> for what? You know? Well, don't you want to pray about it? Mm -mm, no. Either you going to help me or you ain't. And then what happens, you know what happens after that? They become your junkie. Because every time they need a fix, you've trained them. You know where they're coming? To you. Because instead of you giving them what you got, which I, what I hope you got, <laughs> you keep that and give them money. You see, the hard thing about being a disciple of Christ and becoming a disciple of Christ is that you have to make a disciple. You know what's hard about making a disciple? It's a lot of time. A lot of patience. The long suffering. You get a chance to express all those gifts or fruits of the Spirit that he talks about. That's what happened in discipleship because, see, all the while you've been living, God's been discipling you to have and operate in those same fruit that he said you would have. See, many people want to disciple other people, but you got to first get discipled. So when you go and you go to minister to people, you got some fruit in your life that will minister to them. you showing up without any fruit. Well, go ahead and give them a couple of dollars. And don't get mad when they keep coming back. Because <laughs> they're going to believe you their Savior. How many times have you helped somebody out? And, and they, I've heard people even say this, man. Boy, oh boy, you really came through. Boy, you my, you my Savior. No, I'm not. Mm -mm. Because now we got people looking to people instead of looking to God. But you're not going to let that work. You're not going to let that work. Though. Now, because it's going to make you feel good when they tell you, boy, God really used you. <laughs> you're just going to be cheating. <laughs> you're just going to be cheesing, you know, and you're going to feel so good about it that from here on in, you're going to try to take God's place from now on because you already know the answer. Don't let God work for them. Don't let them get to know God. Just know me. I mean, it, and don't get me wrong. I'm not against feeding anybody. But if we're going to feed them, feed them with the love of God so that when they get full, you gave them more than just food. Okay? As the Russians say, you come to me, we will not give you a fish. But we will give you a pole, a line, and a hook. Because if I give you a fish, you can only eat one day. <clears throat> but if I give you the pole, the line, and the hook, you have an opportunity to eat every day of your life. If I give you $2, I know when they got that Mac Double stuff down there for a dollar, you will eat. But what if I gave you Jesus? I mean, what would, what would happen if I gave you Jesus? How many days do you think you'd be eating? Every day. Give us our daily bread. 
but we don't want them to have daily bread. We're not even considering what's going to be like tomorrow for them. But we felt good because we they told us, oh, God bless you. And you ride off in the sunset, you're feeling just as good as you want to feel because, boy, you just done something good. Oh, man, I sure did help them. Did you? You see, it's almost like, no. I'm going to let that go. Let's, let's move on. But, but do you understand what I'm saying? You don't owe no man anything. So unity, a lot of time, what we call unity is not unity. Because the unity that God really wants, he said, we have all been baptized into one body by that one spirit. Have you ever wondered why is that we all got the Holy Ghost? But somehow or another, that same Holy Ghost don't seem to work the same in all of us. I mean, I mean, I'm just being honest. You'll see people spoken tongues, and man can be mean, a junkie or a dog. Smile on Sundays and kill you on Monday. Someone say something to them, they off. Where's the Holy Ghost at? You see, I, I, I believe when he first started this thing, he, you know, they had so many things, in, all things in common, and all kinds of stuff like that. And the reason why they had so much in common because of the spirit they had. And they had to live in their spirit because, you know, it's one thing when we got addresses and we got places that we can go, places where we know we can go. But when God brought persecution on Jerusalem, they didn't know where they were going. Almost like Abraham. He was going, he never dreamed, had no idea. All he knew, God said go, so he went. Am I saying God don't want us to have an address? No, I don't think so. I ain't saying that at all. But I am saying this though. Their unity was a lot different than ours. You know, I, I think they were just really happy to be called Christians. Not us. Matter of fact, that, the word Christian is very generic to us. Because if we say we're a Christian, then somebody's going to ask you, well, what kind of Christian you are? I don't know, but we're just one kind. You know, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't really believe that God has all these segments of Christianity. I, I really don't believe there's such thing as a Baptist Christian, there's no such thing as a Methodist, even an apostolic Christian. No. It's a Christian. Because, see, if you tell me I'm a Baptist Christian, I just need to know what a Baptist needs to believe so I can believe like a Baptist and then call myself a Christian. Same thing with apostolic. Oh, I think we have a great message, but I'm going to tell you this right now. That my message is deeper than that. I have a lot more from this Bible than Acts 238. Knowing that is one thing, but living that is another. Amen. Most people got it down. Oh, man, I've been baptized in Jesus' name. I, were you really baptized in the name? Have you really accepted that baptism yet? Because if you really got baptized in the name, you have accepted more than just water. Amen. That means you have accepted his nature. And his nature is in his name. So it's impossible for me to go and, and brag about how I got baptized in his name, but his name ain't working in me. So knowing all of that, because we do have our unity based upon a lot of that stuff. We have a conference. It's, it's going to be a Pentecostal conference. Baptist they have a Baptist conference and the, all the rest of them, whoever, see Kojic and all of them. So 
what kind of God is an apostolic God? What kind of God is a Baptist God? Is he different? What about the Methodist God? Because I know when I came from that church, they were real quiet. They had a quiet God. I went to a Lutheran church one time. Their God was real quiet too. Baptists came up a little bit. They got a God that loves to sing. Because they sing a lot. Now, us Pentecostals, we got an exciting God. Now, he, he don't get excited outside of church, though. As long as we got him here in this building, he can cause a lot of excitement. Because nobody can be more excited than a Pentecostal church. I heard people say, man, what kind of church is good? Pentecostal, oh, man, y'all get down, don't you? Right? So you come into a Pentecostal church looking for a Pentecostal God. And you know why they're looking for a Pentecostal God? Because we define our God as being that God that makes us all excited as long as we in the bricks. But you catch them same Pentecostal that you saw shouting on Sunday. They won't even speak to you on Monday. Woo, but then we have a time. Did we have a time? Woo! Did they say, woo! Yeah. No, I'm not trying to be funny. But what I'm telling you, we have, even we think, unless there is some excitement, God ain't even showed up. But if he's suddenly coming here Sunday, we don't say no song. Just everybody just kind of like, I want him to shout when I preach. I just talk real. I'm so glad y'all showed up today. Bless the Lord, oh, my soul. All oh, that's within me. And you know what y'all going to think? Man, boy, Brother Wilson used to have the Holy Ghost in fire. He done, he done went cold. Because we know God can't even talk to us unless he's in the volume. His decibels got to be up because it feels good when he talks real loud, right? See, I, I've been, I, you know, like I said, I'm not trying to laugh at us. But I do want to know the truth. I don't want to get in here thinking that, you know what, if I can get excited in here and I, and, and I can sing praise in here and, and I can do all the things we do in here and, and you know, the music get right, got to get a little dance on, do a little stuff, you know. And then when I leave out of here, you know, I leave my Pentecostal God here in this Pentecostal church. So then when I go outside the church, you know what I got to tell the people that I meet that I could have gave Jesus to that I was in here and said I was praising to? Give them 50 cents. Ta-ta, be on your way. Here, get your sandwich. Oh, it's 30. Oh. Now, isn't it strange when you get out of here, you can't give them nothing that you supposed you said you got in there? Don't you think that, don't that, shouldn't that bother you? You're on a job, somebody gets sick. Oh, man, when I get to church tonight, we've been praying for you. Praying for you, church? What happened? You mean tell me God don't work when you outside the building? Are you telling me that if you pray for them and you're not in the church building that he ain't going to work? Believe it or not, we have some mental hurdles we have to get over. And a lot of this is because, you know, we don't understand how God works. We think if we come in here, we all sing together because we know the same notes and sing the same words is that we're really singing together. But really, the real sound that's really God is looking for ain't coming from our lips. It's coming from our heart. And we don't realize that, boy, it sounded good to us and it really sounded, but how did it sound to God? 
See, he knows the difference between what I'm singing in faith and by faith and just singing because I'm singing. He already knows that. So sometimes in our unity, there's more disunity in our unity than we'd even be afraid to admit. It's just like the unity they had at the Tower of Babel. If that unity would have been so great, they would have still been together even after their tongues got confused. But you know what happened? The only unity they had was based upon one common language. And it was not the language of God. That's why it always seemed like the world is against you. Man, everybody in the world is against me. That's why God will tell you, though, guess what? If I be for you, I am more than all the world's against you. Yeah, but they keep coming against me. That's okay. But if I be for you, see, it's not, it's not who's with me, it's who's for me. I, I should never forget who's for me. Because it doesn't matter who you think may be against you. Oh, they're working against me. Let them work. How many of you think whatever they work is working harder than what God has already worked for you? Hmm? I mean, what can they do against his work for you? When God works, is there anybody can stop God from working? So then he tells me, then if I'm for you, I'm more than all the world against you. And we'll turn around, get sidetracked, distracted, looking at everything that's against us and can't see what's for us. God never let me lose sight of who's for me. Because somehow in my mind I believe when God is for you, I don't care who's against you. Ain't nothing anybody can do to stop God when he's for you. Oh, praise God. We got too many examples in the Bible. Sometimes most people don't realize that when those king, Hezekiah, and these guys were surrounded by the enemy. You see that all the time in the Bible. Sometimes they have so many against them, it was like they call them locusts in the field. There's so many of them. Little or small, in the midst of all that, a little small set of people. Isn't this something how God was for the people, that little small group of people, and all those folks against them could not take them down? Now, we read that and get excited until it's our turn. <laughs> you ever know, you know what I'm When it's our turn, all of a sudden we get blind to God, and we can tell you about it. Everything's working against us. I don't have this. I wish I had this. Won't nobody do this for me. I wish somebody helped me. There ain't but one helper that we really need. And the Bible says, God is your helper. Call up on him in times of trouble. And he will. Not, not, not maybe. But he will. He will save you. He'll, he'll deliver you. You know, you, you may not like all the seawater you got to drink, but eventually you won't drink seawater after a while. <laughs> you know, them stormy seas. God, you're going to come through. I told someone before, man. I was trying to get my family, trying to get them to go on a cruise, family reunion. I ain't getting on no boat. Suppose a boat. Try Sink. You know what's really crazy? Suppose you walk out the door and lightning strike you. Hmm? How, how many of you know, you, you don't know tomorrow if you step out your door. In the world we live in now, you ain't even got to do nothing to die. You just be in the wrong place. Bam, shot. So I told him, I said, look, 
I have so much faith in God that if we went on a cruise, the ship is not going to sink. Because if it does, that means God had another plan. <laughs> he, didn't put, he didn't let me in on it. So, but, but you're going to die. You're going to die no matter what. It may not be on a cruise, but you're going to leave here eventually. You can't go to the gym enough and work this out. <laughs> mm -mm. And here you are talking about living in fear. Man, they're going to get in an airplane. It might crash. I'm, I'm surprised some people even get in cars. I said, did you know statistically that there are more people dying in car wrecks than there is in plane crashes? And you can't tell me, you, well, I, you probably don't know nobody personally who died in the plane crash. You know what's really funny, though? Most everyone in here, this place tonight, could tell me about somebody who died in a car crash. And yet you feel safe. You feel real safe, don't you? Isn't that something? How we just live in this small world, and God has such a big world to explore, but we're comfortable in the world we can't control. You know why they built the tower? It was under their control. When it got under God's control, they quit building the tower. Most of the time we're so eager to promote unity when really we need to promote more pureness of heart first. Because a pure heart is a real unifying factor. I'm going to love you with a pure heart. God's going to love you with a pure heart. I've been around a lot of people that I can say I liked. But I, I will be hard pressed to tell you today that I was around all, a lot of people and with a pure heart, with a pure love, I loved them. That, that's a whole new phase in my life today. Trying to learn what his pure love looked like to me, in me. So the <laughs> communication gap, you're trying to reach the world. We're trying to reach the world through their culture. Jesus came to reach the world through his spirit. He gave us the Holy Ghost and said, you know what? Once this thing happened, there ain't going to be no more of that culture stuff really with me because I'm going to make a whole new creation. And what the church never done, the Christian never done, was try to build from that. What we want to do is resurrect the old and try to build better stuff on top of it and Jesus come to tear all that up and give us a whole brand new way of doing things. Mm, 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 mm. You can only have true unity in Christ. Matter of fact, that's why he even said, uh, I pray that they be one even as we. Huh? Have you, have you ever prayed one this prayer? <laughs> Lord, make me one. <laughs> I mean, Lord, let me become one with you, I mean, because really, we don't really want him to be one because, see, the appetite changes. Remember when Jesus coming along there and all of a sudden, somebody was trying to feed him some, I guess, some bread and fish or something. And he told him, he said, no, he said, man, I already got my own lunch. And they looked at him and said, man, did y'all see him go to the store today? He said, did you see him bring a lunch sack or something? Jesus heard him, you know, going on back and forth. He said, well, I need to tell y'all something. I got some meat to eat today. I got some meat to eat. See, you don't know what I'm getting ready to eat. You know why many of us are not satisfied today? 
You want me to tell you why we're not satisfied? Man, and I love T-bone steaks too. But I found out that wasn't the meat he was talking about either. I wanted to be like my dad because he used to burn them up on the altar all the time. <laughs> he seemed to have a real, a real affinity to those big old cowboy steaks and things. He didn't eat pork chops now. But he was them big old cows, them big old oxen. And matter of fact, the priest was the one who needed an oxen. I'm glad I'm called to the ministry. <laughs> See, I don't feel bad eating steak because, see, that was really, you know, it, it, for the priest, they had to offer an ox. Don't let that food go to waste. But Jesus says, you know, I got meat to eat that you know not of. They scratching their head. Because, see, meat, you remember me get total woman, if you drink this water, you'll never thirst again. He said, you know what my meat is? In other words, saying, do you know what my real satisfaction is? Hmm? Do you know why we are unsatisfied today? Do you know why we can't seem to find no satisfaction? It has everything to do with the meat we eat. He recognized the only satisfaction I'm ever going to get in this life it's a do the will of him that called me. So when you're feeling like, boy, I'm just so dissatisfied, man. I don't know. I need, I think I'm going to move to Florida. I need to go here. I need to go there. You're going to find the same thing there you found here. Because you're going to be eating the same old meat you've been eating all your life. <laughs> you haven't figured out that there is a real meat that God wants you to eat. And that meat is his will. My faith is my meat. And unless I'm walking in it, consuming it, that ain't going to have no satisfaction. I find that the more you eat his meat, the less anything else is able to satisfy you. The more you eat. But the more you try to compete with his meat, man, you, you on a trail headed downhill. Ain't nothing ever going to be right. You're going to have a bunch of good days. You're going to have a whole bunch of bad days. And, and it's going to be up and down. And, you know, after a while, you know, uh, she going to say, I, I don't think I love you no more. And you going to say, well, you ain't who you used to be. And, oh, God. When all the time. If we'd been eating the right meat, because that had been changing our spirit. See, we become we have become exactly what we've been eating. We eat stress, and so guess what we do? We live stressed. We eat fear. Guess what we do? We live fear. What would happen if we started eating the real meat of God and wake up every day satisfied? Because you know what we're doing today. I'm eating the meat of God. I'm satisfied. All right? So uh, let me see. I'm going to have to quit here just a second. Here. Let me see what else. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Oh, nah. <laughs> One thing the Tower of Babel teaches us, so, and I, I am going to quit with this, so. There is such an insecurity in human nature. That's why salvation is hard for us to accept. We have such an insecurity, really do. Man, we in, we in a world today uh, where everybody's defining who you are and what size you should be, how, ha how tall you should have grew, and you know, I've I known people who what, want to get more inches, stretch, get stretched, put pads in their shoes and all kind of stuff, trying to be taller. And, you know, we, 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 never, we don't know who we're supposed to be.
But see what happened at the Tower of Babel is that we always have believed if there's a lot of activity, there must be a lot of God. The more activity you see, the more you're going to believe a whole lot of God is working. So, these people at the Tower of Babel, it was easy to convince the other people that something was really going on because a lot of people was involved. But isn't it strange? There was nothing going on there in the name of God. But if you saw it from the outside, if you saw the activity, if you saw everybody working and in tune, tune, I mean, it's like everybody just sees it's got to be God. It was, God was not even there. And when he did come there, they left. <laughs> when God came, they left all of their activities. Well, I'm getting ready to close. That's the reason why today I think that we have built this, this insecurity among church people and made them feel like if we're not active with a bunch of activity that we don't have God. God was in none of that. One other instance. Prior to that, they should have known. All them people outside the boat. You think they wasn't doing some stuff? Hmm? And you would have thought, since all those people that was outside the boat, they seem to be having more fun. Because I don't see Noah really having a good time. But it was satisfied. <laughs> he had to be satisfied. You don't, you don't work 100 years on a project and not be satisfied. Something had him. But see, faith is meat. There's a satisfaction in faith that you'll get nowhere else. So while they were all out there talking and playing and laughing and telling Noah, you got to be the biggest nut I ever seen. See, if you're insecure, you won't be able to eat the meat of God. But when you finally realize one thing, I done tried everything. I ain't been satisfied. Maybe I ought to try his faith and do his will. Question, statement. Okay. <laughs>